Thank you, Kina, for uh, bringing us projects, projections, and sight to blind spots, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, I'd like to actually start before I introduce the second panelist to give you a little bit of insight as to what might be in front of you. Um, trying to determine when discussing the um, symposium how to make it as unacademic as possible. Um, and felt that the best way to do so was to give you something so that you can, for those who have forgotten how to draw, give you the implements to b give the opportunity to draw, or uh, pieces for sculpture for idle hands. Um, for those who have spent many hours in pews at Sunday morning or elsewhere, as you will recognize uh, the, the association. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce um, Dr. John Warner is the second speaker for this morning panel. As one of the founders of the field of green chemistry, John has demonstrated his ability to imagine a new frame for a scientific inquiry, asking fundamental questions about the relationship of toxicity and creativity, calling on chemists and industry to critically account for the legacy of their production and invention. John brings to this conversation experience drawn from the commercial, Polaroid for instance, academic, U UMass Boston, and civic engagement, an incredible um, and prolific activity in changing the way in which we educate. He is currently the president and chief technical officer of Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry, an entity he founded and established with careful attention to how the institute creates an atmosphere for intellectual stimulation, creativity, passion, and innovation for scientists and multidisciplinary teams. His work is lodged at the intersection of science, social responsibility, markets, and health, all rich and contested areas that demand the attention of a fertile imagination, negotiating precedent with intuition. Please join with me in welcoming Dr. John Warner to Aftertaste. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and have an opportunity to speak. Uh, awed by the, the previous speaker, and uh, it's interesting that when we talk about light and shading, as a chemist, I'm working in the dark because we can never see the molecules. And it's an interesting aspect of the work that I was thinking about as, as you were speaking, that uh, form and function at the molecular level is not uncertain, but it's a figment of the imagination because we can never be absolutely certain what it is that we're looking at. In the discussion of intersections, it's, it's interesting. At a first pass analysis, if you look at any interface between two materials, you feel that as you approach it and you get closer, it becomes more discreet and you can understand where one material begins and one material ends and whatnot. But it's actually the opposite. When you get to the molecular level and you start to look at materials, you find that surfaces become less discrete and that molecules start to interface and there are no straight lines and there's no beginning and no end of any material and that uh, doorknob and the door have no discrete interface at the molecular level, but they are at, the, at some point simultaneously occupying the same space. But that space that it's occupying is in the dark. And it's kind of interesting. Um, so I have, I've, I'm going to do, do my best to, to um, have a conversation with you about chemistry. I'm sure a lot of people see the word chemistry and are terrified. And I was partially as thinking, and I was going to get up and say, obviously, there's a lot of fascinating things to think about when you compare a chlorine atom that adjacent to a carbonyl and how many times. Yeah. But I decided I wouldn't do that, but I just did. Um, this is my office up in Boston. Um, <laughs> so it is so wonderful to come south and bathe in your warmth. And so thank you very much for, the, for this opportunity to escape the igloo. Um, again, I, I've got a strange background. I'm trained as, you know, I actually went undergraduate as a music major and had a horrible high school education as far as the sciences are concerned and had absolutely no appreciation for what science was. I was marginally good at music and so for my entire life I was saw myself as a musician, as an artist and that there were two types of people, scientists and artists and obviously I was in the other camp. When accidentally I stumbled into a research lab when I was a music major 
And everything changed very quickly when I realized that scientists imagine things, that scientists create things. I started to question, was Galileo an artist or a scientist? Was da Vinci an artist or a scientist? Is the word art and the word science a human construct that's probably only a couple hundred years old and that the raw human experience doesn't know those words. That's just a, such an artificial thing that we superimpose on things, maybe because of the advent of the university and we needed to know where to send paychecks, but maybe that's it. And that this compartmentalization is part of what the handcuffs are that we have to start talking about imagination because of the handcuffs that we construct in our attempt to compartmentalize. Perhaps as you learn the compartments, we sacrifice imagination. And so it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting strange, strange way of looking at it. But through flotsam and jetsam, I become a chemist. Next thing you know, I go to Princeton, and, uh, and I become a medicinal chemist working on an anti-cancer drug. Um, Princeton, you know, a lot of people worked with me on this project, but Princeton now has a seven-story chemistry building built entirely on the proceeds of this one molecule called Olympta sold by the Eli Lilly company. So here I am, a medicinal chemist destined to go into academia, when out of the blue, a corporate officer from Polaroid called me in my lab. He'd been following my career. We went to lunch, and he offered me the job to head exploratory research at Polaroid. Now, to me, growing up in Cambridge, Boston area in Massachusetts, Polaroid was the most awesome place in the world as a chemist, but also as an artist to imagine. Edwin Lynn, just this amazingly prolific inventor, artist, genius person. And I went from being a medicinal chemist to getting into optics and materials and polymers and things that I never thought that I'd be getting into. And someday I'm going to say, you know what a phot photograph is, and some people are going to say, what? You know, and there was a time, as, as the earlier quote was, the, there was a time when there was a thing called a camera and you couldn't make a telephone on it, uh, call on it. And, and, and I have deep in, embedded in, in my, the fiber of my being the love of photography and the, the, the love of optics and still think that forever humans will be loving and playing with lenses. And so I just fell in love with the, the previous presentation because it's just so beautiful. So what would? a medicinal chemist do at a place like Polaroid. So I started contemplating what it meant to, to make things in society. We do, as chemists have for 180 years, we've come up with some pretty cool things. We've got drugs that are curing sick people. We've got materials that are you know, closing the cold. We've got agricultural agents and electronics. We've got some really cool things. But if you think about it, everything we do is strange in that it's at high temperature, high pressure with harsh conditions that we make everything. The chemical manufacturing process is an incredibly violent thing and where we're heating things up and putting things under pressure. And yet you look outside the window and you look at nature and you find molecular diversity and molecular complexity that humans can't approach. But not only is the structure and the function complex and diverse, but the way nature makes it is also everything's at room temperature, everything's at ambient pressure, and for the most part, everything's using water as a solvent. So not only can't humans not do what nature does, we can't do it the way nature does. And this is an old story. A lot of people have made this observation. But while I was at Polar, I, I said, why? Why is it that humans can't do this? And I could go on and on and on about this, but the bottom line is, a thermometer is a molecular speedometer. Now, I, I, I hate to do this here, we're going to have a little chemistry lesson here. Okay, so get ready for your chemistry lesson, all right. And I'll, I'll use my voice instead of my, my, my typical chemistry voice here, and, and I'll say that. When we learn about molecules, we find out that atoms have unique geometries, that the electrons possess certain spatial orientations around the nuclei of atoms. And when two molecules react, they don't just bang into each other and react. Most of the time, as the molecules are banging into each other, nothing happens. The only time a mo two molecules react is when a unique, singular, precise geometry is accommodated. Then and only then, does a chemical reaction happen? And so the reason we heat things up into high temperature and put things under high pressure is because it makes the molecules go faster. 
And because the molecules are going faster, there are more collisions. And because there are more collisions, the reactions happen. Okay, so here's the epiphany. Never in nature is there a reactive collision. In everything that happens in physiological systems, everything that happens in plants and all the organisms and things in life, you never have two things bang into each other and react. What happens is through a, a, a non-solution-based form, the molecules come and they snuggle up to each other. And through non-covalent interactions, they actually assemble. And then after they're together, they react. It's a two-step process of meeting and joining and then reacting, not just colliding randomly and happening. And once I said it, you know, again, I've got to scare you here with the chemistry stuff. I came up with this concept, and I started doing things called non-covalent derivatization. All right? So we won't go into it too much, but I would warn you, if you wanted to go into this a lot, one of the things I did came up with a way of dissolving materials in a photographic film system or medical diagnostic system doing this. But non-covalent derivatization, just to wait, the license plate of my car is NCV. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I promise you, I could talk about this in a way that you would be all passed out and sound asleep and I could be in mon monotone here for about three more days. Um, nevertheless, <laughs> It's strange, the photographic industry started calling one of the things I did Warner Complexes. Now, it's kind of strange to have a complex named after you, but Polar was very happy and we went to large scale manufacturing. In the United States, you can't just do that, you have to get EPA approval. And so you had to get what's called a low volume exemption pre manufacturing notification. Now, this is before computers. These are three bankers' boxes filled and wrapped and shipped to Washington, D.C., and we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And they rejected the application, not because of toxicity, not because of environmental impact. They just couldn't point to a textbook in which they ever learned about non-covalent derivatives. They didn't know what I was talking about. Oh, small particles, are you crazy? So because of their inability to know what I was talking about, I had to go to Washington and talk to the EPA about non-covalent derivatization. When I get, went there, I, I encountered Paul Anastas, who was the Office of Pollution Prevention Talks. Synchronicity being an amazing thing, this was someone who I went to undergraduate school with, was playing in a jazz band with his older brother. I knew this guy really well, and so I could kind of give him a dope slap upside the head and say, wait a minute, isn't by definition anything better for the environment going to be a product of innovation and creativity and something that is new. And if the mechanisms of the EPA say anything new is difficult to do, isn't the EPA in fact inhibiting the design of non-toxic environmentally benign things? Isn't shouldn't we be doing the other thing? And so that was the and so I, I just to get a little bit more serious about this, here I am, a chemist, Ivy League University, PhD, a document Pat it, you know, handed to me, I'm patted on the top of the head, said, go off to industry and invent the future. Every year in the United States, we have 15,000 undergraduates in chemistry, 3,000 masters, 3,000 doctoral degrees. In 2004, for the first time in history, more women became chemists than men. Ready for it? Wait for it. To get a degree in chemistry, not one university requires a student in chemistry to have a class in toxicity or environmental impact. Why do we have red dyes that cause cancer? Why do we have plasticizers that cause birth defects? Why do designers struggle to find materials that they can feel good about when they design their materials because of all the nasty that's in the materials? Well, how could they not if the only people who have the ability to make a new molecule have nothing to do with the ability to predict the toxicity environmental impact? That should scare you, but it also should give you a great deal of hope there may be a path to the future here. <laughs> Let's start teaching this to chemists. And so Paul and Astis and I said, here is an unmet need. And we came up with this concept called green chemistry. And I joked that I feel like Forrest Gump. This, if, had I thought anyone was ever going to read this book, we would have written a much better book. But <laughs> you know, if you read the thing, you, it's just so much common sense. There's nothing brilliant in it. Yeah, chemists should do things that don't hurt the environment, aren't toxic. But it was at the right time, at the right place in the early 90s that next thing you know, I'm just 
it gets translated into 15 different languages. I've been to over 40 countries meeting presidents and prime ministers and cutting ribbons for something that anybody could have written. It's just, again, a synchronicity of time that these two kids bumped into each other and did that. And I talk about the 12 principles of green chemistry, of what it should take if you're a designer at the molecular level. How do you anticipate those long-term impacts on human health and the environment and what we define as sustainability and what can you do? Because if you invent a material and it's, not to and it's toxic and has environmental problems and it gets on the market, it's over. It's very difficult to stop that. Our only hope is to invent things that aren't toxic in the first place. And if the people inventing have no training in that, it's impossible. So green chemistry, as far as I'm concerned, sh although there is a role for regulation and subsidies, in a perfect utopia, technologies and, and materials would all be better for the environment, but they'd also have superior performance and superior cost. Every time we force somebody to use something that doesn't quite work or is too costly because of the environment, that's probably required, we should, but wouldn't it be better if the chemist had the skill to invent it right in the first place? So my definition of green chemistry would be sacrifice nothing. We have performance, cost, and oh, by the way, it doesn't give people cancer and it doesn't cause global warming. And that's the dream, that's the vision of green chemistry. So at, after 10 years of adoring Polaroid and loving being at Polaroid, I decided to go back to academia and I did you know, full professor chair of chemistry and engineering in the Lowell and, and Boston campus and started a PhD program in green chemistry. So for the next 12 years, I had about 120 students, PhD, master's, undergraduate level. They took every class that a typical chemistry student would have, but added a one semester course in toxicology, a one semester course in environmental mechanisms, a one semester course in law and policy. And over those 20 years, the, the average time it took one of the students to get a job from industry, two days. The longest any student graduating from this program was on the market looking for a job was two weeks because she turned down the first eight job offers. Still now, I've been out of this for nine years, I'm still getting phone calls from companies, John, you got any students graduating? Because it's kind of cool to be able to solve problems but have a clue about toxicity and environmental impact. So after doing that for 12 years, I, I got frustrated said, because I, I really want to be an inventor. I wanted to show the world that it's not, what's well, one thing to say, you should do it safely. But if I could show that you could do it safely and work within the economics of society, that would be an even better thing. So here I am, a full tenured professor in two departments, you know, state university, and I quit in 2007 in history's worst economy. I'm not the brightest person in the world. And I started a for-profit company to do this green chemistry vision that I had. And it is a dream come true. Jim Babcock, my, my business partner, is just amazing visionary guy. This is a 42,000 square foot facility with every piece of research equipment that I've ever touched in my life under one roof to make molecules, to make polymers, to fabricate devices, to evaluate the devices. And the toys are just beautiful. And an open invitation, we're up in Wilmington, Massachusetts, for anyone who ever wants to come and see it. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the toys are the toys, it's the people and the beautiful, amazing people that have been able to, to, to get into. We've had you know, zero turnover in two and a half years. We've got 35 employees and we don't write any papers. We don't speak at technical conferences. All we do is we invent. And you come in, so there's no students writing theses, but today is Saturday, I bet you there's people working. If you go at 10 o'clock at night, there's people and there's a certain passion about what we're doing here because it's not just solving problems but doing it in a way that's somewhat meaningful in, in another way. So let me give an, a snapshot of some of the things that we're doing because I think this is for, for the theme of this. We approach solving problems in a very different way. <laughs> it's, it's not very typical. So for example, and this is just in the last three years, about 30 scientists, in the last three years, we have an Alzheimer's drug in clinical trials in Australia. All right, that Michael J. Fox had funded for a certain period of time. We demonstrated its viability. It's now in humans. We have a Alzheimer's drug that is in tr clinical trials. That's, that's actually, we've shown cognition results in, in a variety of different um, in, um, 
metabolic processes. Now, wait, ready for this? We have an asphalt technology. Well, you know, there's a one billion miles of road in the United States. 10% gets repaved every year. They dig that up and put it in a landfill because the sun and the air oxidize and make brittle that top surface. And so because they can't use it, they essentially throw it, and they may be able to get about 5%. So I had this crazy idea of how to put an additive in to allow you to use recycled material and put it you know, in, at lower temperature. And so <laughs> being a silly person, a week before Thanksgiving two years ago, Two trucks with 30 tons of asphalt came to my house. My family was insanely mad because our driver was perfectly good to begin with. They <laughs> dug it up. They, and the workers were laughing at me. It was 17 degrees Fahrenheit. They said, John, you're going to open this up and a big hockey puck is going to come out. All right? It's way too cold and you've got 65% recycled material. That's not possible. They opened it up squealed like school children as it powdered out, jumped on their little roll and things, and they, they put it out, and here it is, a year and a half later, not one pebble dislodged, not pebble. I was a very courageous, silly person. I had someone from the Massachusetts Department of Transportation from the Federal Highway Board there while it was happening, going, okay, okay, okay. And, and so now it's been paved in about three, 4,000 miles of roads in the country, being specced in different states, different things. I had to start another company called Collaborative Aggregate, <laughs> and the name of the company is <laughs> Delta S, okay? And, and that's it. Now, you may think that that's strange. Let's take a, take, take a step back and take a moment. Listen, here I am, standing with a hard hat and boots, <laughs> holding onto a shovel in a pile of asphalt, and my cell phone rings. And it's some scientists in Finland talking about cognition studies of a molecule that I made and what's happening with mice and for, for, for an Alzheimer's disease looking at the interaction with proteins. Now you may look at that and say, that's strange. But in fact, it isn't. Because the mechanism of taking a molecule and looking at how the choreography of proteins and metals in the brain make things stick together, and the way a polymer wraps around sand and gravel stick together, to me, is exactly the same thing. Asphalt, neurochemistry, the same thing. But again, our little boxes of education would never let a, a scientist in those two fields ever think that they're in the same, the same intellectual place. And so it allows you, once you get rid of the boxes, it's not that everything, you know, while diversity is beautiful, there's also commonality is also, also beautiful. And the boxes don't allow us to see commonality. Another example, I want to make sure I, I, I get a, you know, help here. One day I'm looking at a bug. I don't know why I'm looking at a bug. And I'm contemplating the bug and saying, well, gee whiz, when a bug gets big, it doesn't grow its exoskeleton. It breaks it off and then it's soft and white. And over the course of a couple hours, it turns hard and black again. All right? And so I said, that's interesting. That's a white to black natural process, light to dark. And so I looked at the, the, it's an enzymatic cascade of tyrosinases and things like that. So I mimicked the chemistry, put it in a petri dish, bought a bunch of gray hair, stuck it in there, and it went dark. Huh. <laughs> and so I'm looking at the strands, and there's a black here, and a brown here, and a light brown. I go, man, this is all different colors. I called the vendor and said, oh, no, John, you don't understand. This is a bunch of different people's hair. So OK, all right. Hit me. So I sat in the chair. I'm the grayest person in the building. And they, they, they ended up doing, doing my hair. And next thing you know, we realized this is not a hair dye. This is a topical treatment that restores the original color hair. If you had black hair and it's gone gray, you get black hair. If it's brown hair and it's gone gray, you get brown hair, and so on and so forth. It's now, you know, and I, I've, I never issue press releases. I like my invisibility in the dark small molecules, but um, the company that I licensed it to is called Hairprint, and this month it'll be released. It's kind of weird. I'm kind of weirded out. The box actually says invented by Dr. John Wanner, which I'm not too crazy about, but um, this, this, is, this, is, this is happening. Uh, another example, uh, uh, um, DNA. When you shine light on DNA, the thymines do a reaction. All right. So I said, what if I took thymine and put it in polymers? Huh. Well, next thing you know, I find out that I can also, with these polymers, these biopolymers that respond to light to do this thymine reaction, I started to find out I could curl hair. 
So next thing you know, I have a product that allows you to curl hair. Now, the Brazilian blowout uses formaldehyde on people's hair. So again, looking at this, this works. This is something interesting. I actually you know, got some award from the Society of Cosmetic Chemists for it. But I said, wait a minute, wood is really nasty for formaldehyde. If the mechanism of curling hair, if I can do that. And so four weeks ago in Alberta, Canada, we pressed 50 tons of OSB wood. That's four by eight panels that outperform incumbent technology that has a lower price point without a drop of formaldehyde, without a drop of MDI, entirely bio-based, that in an ironic, weird way is related to the chemistry of curling hair. Go figure, all right? <laughs> So I want to finish, finish, you know, so a couple, couple years ago, Fortune magazine stuck me on the stage with the CEO of Dow, Andrew Laveras, talking about the future of the chemical industries. And at the end, someone says, John, can big companies innovate? Have companies lost the ability to innovate? I'm standing next to the guy. What am I going to say? And I, and I actually said, no, big companies innovate more than small companies. In fact, it's a linear relationship that the bigger a company is, the more they, they, but the problem is that is a linear relationship in size, but the fear of failure, the mechanisms to thwart innovation because of some bizarre fear is a nonlinear reaction. So as a company gets bigger, those forces to suppress innovation outpace the innovation itself. And so without really good management and decision making, yeah, they can't. But the problem is, interestingly enough, those companies are rejecting success every day because of this fear relationship. And if you think about it, a child is born with maximum imagination and they walk through life and they learn for reasons to suppress it. I don't believe you build someone's imagination. You find ways of removing what has been injected into their life to, to prevent it in the first place. And that's bigger the company, better they are at doing that. And so, oh, I'll just, I'd love to talk about this water harvesting technology. Thought, forgot that I had one more example here where we, when the sun is out, a film absorbs water. When the moon comes out, it lets it go. Imagine a rowboat in the ocean that all day accumulates water, and when the sun goes down, it rains pure water in the rowboat. So we've, this is a technology that we're, we're, we've, we've been pushing forward. Or you go really, really fast, and in the shadow, again, of light and dark, the shadow of a windmill, you go on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, accumulate and drop, accumulating drop water. So we have this cool water purification harvesting technology. But I want to get to the innovation. I forgot that last slide there. And so. Um, this is how I, I've, I've been going about it, and I am not so presumptuous to believe I have some gifted insight here. So as I talk about innovation, please, I do not believe I have some beautiful, wonderful, amazing view that everybody else should do. It works for me. I've gone through life, I look at the world in a certain way, and I, in great vulnerability, will share these thoughts with you, but no way am I presumptuous to say you must embrace these thoughts. This is the way I look at innovation, so with great you know, humility, who the hell am I to do this? Here are my elements of innovation to try to talk about this a minute. And the first one, all innovation begins with science fiction. Yesterday, I've, uh, I am the, the world's, one of the most huge science fiction fans, and yesterday we lost someone very, very important in science fiction. Um, the annual awards for science fiction is called the Hugo Awards and the Nebula Awards, and every year science fiction writers get awards. And the dream come true happened to me two, year, two or three years ago. I was asked to give the this, this, this speech at the annual science fiction uh, convention. That was funny. I can walk up to Nobel Prize winners in chemistry and go, hey, how you doing, dude? What's happening? But uh, here, I'm like shaking in my boots because my favorite authors, I mean, it's a weird, strange thing. And so to stand in front of a group of 600 Wookiees and Ewoks and things like that it was a different and interesting thing. But if you think about it, when you imagine something that can't be done, you're in the domain of imagination and science fiction. So every invention must, by definition, go through a science fiction phase. And so on a good day, I drive to work writing science fiction, and on my ride home, I've turned some of it into science fact. But you can't innovate and create without that first step. 
Now, how many science, technology programs, the design programs acknowledge that part of things? And that's where I think that art and science thing gets a little bit funny, and we really need to look at that intersection in another way. Another one is, and this is something that's, again, about light and dark and focus and periphery, and this, uh, we know that invention and creativity doesn't always happen where you're focusing, but the periphery of it. You know, we, we look at things in different ways, and that's where diversity comes into play, because everyone's peripheral vision, in an interesting way, in the same way that you can design a building to occlude a space so that you can't see it. You got enough people together, you remove blind spots, because everyone's peripheral opens up so that there's a lens on everything. And so this, where, where, where collaboration must come together in, in a way that's, that's super productive. And so we need to find ways of reinforcing that and not just focusing on, on, on a, the, the single target. But that The third one is the one I think is most controversial. Encyclopedic knowledge inhibits innovation in the absence of intuitive knowledge. This is what I'm very critical about. I feel that in education, it's very easy to measure encyclopedic knowledge. We can get a Scancron test, we have people fill it out, we put it in a machine and they get an 87 percent, this one gets a 62 percent. That's the ability to cite precedent. And the ability to cite precedent is wonderful, but you know what, in 2015 that's called Google. <laughs> uh, intuiting, doing something with that knowledge is a very hard thing to measure, but it's a funny thing, we're in a world, human nature, that which is measurable is that which is valued. So therefore, you can measure encyclopedic knowledge, but you can't measure intuitive knowledge. And so that, I think, is a really critical thing we've got to look at as we go forward. Um, the next, you know, oh, there's a nice little picture. I love to put that picture up there. I just all deference there. I, this is being hiring scientists. You wouldn't believe how many times I experienced this one. Um, but um, the, the ability to innovate is simultaneously proportional to, the wis to wisdom and the tolerance of risk. If I got here and I said to you guys, hey, I got this great idea, and everyone said, oh, that's a good idea, and it ended up working. Now, if I said, hey, I've got this great idea, and you all said, you idiot, that will never work, and it ends up working, which is more imaginative, which is more creative? The latter, not the former. All right, and the, the problem is all of our mechanisms of peer review, of getting approval to do something, is to convince the most people that it's going to work, which is anti-imagination. The more creative, the more courageous you are to leap, the less likely you are to get permission to do. Okay, and so the, my, my favorite example is Dan Schechtman. He got the Nobel Prize in chemistry three years ago for quasi-crystals. And if anyone has been following Nobel Prizes, the big thing was this guy got thrown out of his university, ostracized from the chemistry community, because they said, you are crazy, this is nonsense, this is crap. And 10, 15 years later, through perseverance and hard work and just strong personality, he got the science community to accept it. Next thing you know, he gets the Nobel Prize. How many Nobel Prize discoveries do we flush down the toilet every day because the personality of that inventor isn't appropriate? Isn't it a condemnation of what we do in creativity and imagination that, oh, you can be creative and imaginative as long as you fit into this little box? And so it's those boundaries are the killers. All right? And so it's just, it's just me. And then the final one. Is important in my world, and, and again, I suspect chemistry manifests itself. You know, what I'm saying here probably has some resonance in other fields. I'm only a chemist, so I just can look at it from that perspective. I have found that this discussion of simplicity versus complexity, that's an interesting conversation. But there are very imaginative things that are simple, and there are very imaginative things that are complicated. The two aren't really related. And when people think that, oh, the only good inventions are simple inventions, are, oh, to really be good, I've got to make something really complicated, those are good discussions. But when it comes to measuring, once you put a box around should it be complex or should it be simple, you're limiting your ability to imagine. And although from real world practical purposes this might have relevance, it probably doesn't in, in any other way. So my last thought that I, I want to talk about, just be done here, is just Go through this thought with me. You're at a museum. You're looking at a painting. We have the skill set to look at a painting and say, oh, look at the, the brush stroke, the use of the brush. Look at the use of color. We can technically evaluate 
art. We can look at a piece of music. We can look at a script of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a poem or something like that, and we can analyze it quite technically. In fact, we could probably put things on Excel spreadsheets and compare this and compare that. But in art, we step back and we say, I like it. It's beautiful. There's an aesthetic component when we evaluate art. In science, it's considered bad science to interject the aesthetics. And so therefore, in science today, we have half humans doing work because you've got to deny that aesthetic. In fact, when you write a piece in science, you must use the third person and say, three grams of this was reacted with seven grams of this to do the following. It's not, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. It's three grams of this and three grams of that. And the funny thing about that is, is that pollution is ugly. And if I can say to you, I didn't make a carcinogen, three grams of this and seven grams of that did, and we separate ourselves, then you get a non-sustainable society that is struggling to find a way to get on the right ends. And so, in a weird and strange way, when we discuss art and science as two separate buckets, we're contributing to the problem. We all create, we all are technical, we all have both sides of a human brain, and the future is putting it all together and ignoring the boundaries. Thanks. <laughs>